Okay, I think we can start. Uh, well, my name is Oscar Rodriguez. Some of, some of you already know me. I'm the product marketing manager of uh, NPS. Uh, I'm going to start a keynote. Uh, the keynote is composed of three main sections. The first one is the, the one that I will do. It's the marketing insights. And I, give, I will say some words about the marketing and the community, how it's growing, the services that we offer, and something that we call development plan. Uh, something like roadmap. Uh, then, don't worry, mine is actually a shorter, so it will just be marketing stuff. Then Baslab, he will talk about what's new in MPS for the past one year and a half. And then Alex Chatelain, he will talk about he will talk about web MPS and he will show them. So, okay. just to start, just a brief history of MPS. Uh, we start MPS start as an experimental project in 2002. Our first version, MPS 1.0, was released in 2009. And now we have, we just launched two months ago, the current version, which is 2019.2. Every year we launch three releases per year. Uh, most, not, most, most of them is between April, August, and November or December. So now we're working in 2019.3. Okay, well, NPS is one of the products of JetBrains. JetBrains is well known for doing tools for developers, IDEs, and also Kotlin and different team tools. Uh, okay, just marketing insights. This is our download, uh, download graph by version. So this is the how many downloads in the last two years divided by, uh, separated by different versions. So we have been have like kind of growing Great, and that's actually we're proud of it. It's been increasing more than 300% from the last two years. Uh, this one, the one in the right, this is September last month. So we hit our record of more downloads uh, ever in that month. And also the release day of 2019.2 was the, our record of more downloads of that day. So, I mean, we're growing, that's the point of this. <laughs> Uh, we have been improving our SEO insights for the specific key terms that we that we want to improve. Uh, basically, these three terms are right now in our uh, when you when you look on, on Google, you will find we will be in the top ten. And compared to other years, we we have improved this. And so, two years ago, in domain specific languages, we were not even in the second page. Uh, this was based. Um, yeah. You have to add, add, add at least a thousand downloads for the 2018 2.6 because we have an internal repository where we. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, okay, that's good. <laughs> 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 Let's continue. Um, <laughs> we also are focusing a lot on events. Last year in October, we sponsored our first event as NPS. Uh, it was Models 18 in Copenhagen. We also had a NPS day, basically a beginner's event inside that event of Models. Uh, we had an introductory talk in the tech meetup of Nostrava Czech Republic. We also sponsor Models War 2019 this February in Prague. Uh, we participate in a contribution in the Language Dev Meetup in Amsterdam this March. And last month, we also sponsor Models 2019 in Munich. Also in this one, we had the MPS Day uh, Beginners event uh, during the conference. So the point here is like we are also trying to be more involved in the different communities and to spread the word of MPS. Uh, these are the community events or talks that the community have done in 2018. So it's around more than even 27 talks or events related to MPS or with a talk of MPS from the community. We were, we were just involved indirectly, sometimes we uh, supporting them with swag, with content, or an indirect support. Uh, also, last year, we the NPS Netherlands user group was 
found it. Uh, actually, I think some of you already are, in, are inside this group. Uh, and well, for those of you that you that are not, you can just join the get to the website, and there will be like uh, you can get all the information of the events. Uh, we're happy about the community events because compared to the previous year, uh, we grow like a lot in terms of <laughs> talks and events. So the community has been more involved and more uh, eager to do these kind of talks and events. Um, education. We know that this is one of the key parts of uh, learning of MBS, the learning phase. Uh, so we create a free online course on our Stepit platform, educational platform. So it's already available on our website, I think like probably maybe one year. Um, we're constantly improving our tutorials. Yeah, I know that there's a lot of updated, not updated uh, content, but we are working on it. We know and we, uh, we always try to update and actually it always helps us when you uh, report that. We have our issue tracker and you can even also report of this kind of um, I mean, update like the content that we have. Um, there's also community content. Uh, there's like the series of videos of Harry Meta by Kolya on Twitch platform. There's also the tutorial of Marcus of programming for non-developers. And plus 24 more articles, paper, <coughs> tutorials made by the community. It's, we just try to support them, but always indirectly. Um, documentation for 2019.1, we <coughs> migrate all our content of, of, docu of documentation and, and tutorials, or the fast track tutorial, <coughs> to our own help center. The reason why we're doing this, the first <coughs> one is, it's our space actually, it's more flexible to do it. It also has the, the option to, to provide feedback for every like, page of the documentation. And also, it's very good in terms of uh, working with different versions because that was actually the problem with the with the previous platform. Else, okay, services. Uh, MPS is an open source, as you can see, as you, as you know. So we make money based on the services around MPS. So our services are divided into three, uh, three services. We have training, which is, we offer introductory training and advanced training. Our main trainer is Basla. You don't know him, he's going to be next. So, uh, we also offer this remote training where we provide uh, like the user, the content of the introductory training, and we only provide uh, guidance and or like question and, and answer sessions remotely. Um, we have consultancy. Consultancy is uh, we basically charge per day, and it can be on-site and remote service. The, consul the consultancy is divided. It can be either guidance or answers of the, for their for your questions, or it can be development. We can even support you in the development of your project or specific feature or whatever you need well, of FDS. Um, we have support contracts. Support contracts is more for major projects where they need like constant support of different issues that they will have <coughs> for their project. And as Klaus said, we are close to uh, to to finish this deal with with Itemis, so we can support also the clients from Itemis. So the the clients that have with Itemis, they will have an option so to have also support contract with us through Itemis. Through Itemis. Um, Okay, for MPS 2019.3, for, for 2019.3, we are focusing in product stabilization. We just stopped the feature development for this release because uh, we want to focus in stabilize the product and actually fix a lot, as much as much issues as possible. So we have over more than 1,000 <laughs> issues that we want to. Uh, review and try to at least assign it or fix them somehow. Uh, so all that all the team is basically focusing this goal for this release. Uh, we have a voting system on our issue tracker in Jutra. You can vote for this box. So 
one of the criteria or variable that we define to solve that issue is how many boats they have. So actually, this is an opportunity for the community to get involved. So you can vote for the most salary issues, and we can and we give more priority to the ones that have more votes. Um, okay, for plans from the future. Uh, since 2019.1, we've been uh, making more uh, making more features based on the paying customers' requests. So we are even showing on the what's new page like the features that were client, uh, that were sponsored by the clients and development plan. Uh, since I think for the last years, people have been asking the NPS team about the roadmap. Uh, it's really hard for us to define a roadmap because our highest priority is always the paying customers. So at the end, if we have a request from paying customers, we have to focus first on that one because I mean this is our the main reason, our main service. But we decide to uh, we have a development plan, which is which means like every release we gather together with the MPS team <coughs> and we have this plan where we put all the features that we want to do or we plan to do in the future for the next release or the, or the, re or the future releases. So what we decide to do is to make this development plan public. So this, this plan, I'm going to get, make it public next week. I, I, will get you, I will send a link to all of, the, all, all of you for the uh, closing email after the event so you can have an access there. Uh, but I can even show you how it looks like. Okay, this is the development plan of 2019.2. Uh, for 2019.3, we don't have because it's product stabilization, but we will have one for 2020.1. So, how it works is like we will have like a list of uh, these potential features, and this is based in uh, talks with the community, voting of the issue. I mean, don't worry, this will be public. So, uh, well, based also in the community, in the feedback from the paying customers and the, the features of our issue tracker that have more voting. So, based on that, we create this document and we work and we try to get like the most features possible from this document. So, for the next release, we take this as a base and we cannot modify it. So that the point here is like it doesn't mean that we have to, we will do everything here, but this is our direction. So that's why we wanted to share with you so you can at least know be aware of what are we thinking about. And sorry, I think that's all for me. Now is yeah, you can see grammar cells are also here. Uh, okay, I'm just curious now listening to Oscar when I look at the slides. Uh, how many of you, or is there anyone here who actually tried MPS version 1.0? Perfect. Well, we've got one hero here. <laughs> You've been with MPS for 10 years, right? If I remember correctly. Right. No, I must be older, much older. 10 years ago is when we started. Must be right. much longer. 2009 was the release of one, MPS 1.0. Well, well, then I, but then there were some kind of versions before that. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay, well then, me too. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but we know you are a hero, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Perfect. My goal here is, is to, to show, show you what we've been working on over the past one and a half year, roughly. Right. So I went through all the features we published in that period and took those that I think are most relevant and I wanted to highlight them here because Unless you pay close attention to every single release and all the release notes and what, what's in use, then perhaps you might miss some. And also, I want to give you the, the feeling that we really you know, work you know, in MPS and trying to make it better uh, so that you do not feel like that we're just fixing bugs, which now you might get that feeling because the next release is really the bug fixing. <laughs> right? But that's not the point. We want to fix the you know, we get some sort of controversial feedback. Some people would like us to implement more features. Some people complain that the stability and usability of the tool should be improved. So we decided, you know, let's focus on one thing at a time. So fixing now features then. 
Um, but here I'll show you a few features uh, from the past, which I think are worth sharing. Uh, now, using this new remote control, so bear with me, it might take a while before I get used to it, but I find it quite handy. So, look at this, uh, well, maybe I can make that a, bit, a little bit better, bigger. <coughs> that helps. Yeah, look at this language definition and tell me if you can see something unusual about that language I just went to. Can anybody spot something that you haven't seen yet in OBS? Multiple generators. Multiple generators, right. <laughs> so that's one of the, I'm running this from, from the sources, right? So this is like the master of the, for, for the next release. So there might be actually some new features in the next release. One of them is the, is the generators. We're now working on the generators that actually allow more generators per language, so you will not have to create dummy languages just to be able to generate multiple targets. Uh, we actually also plan to make generators stand alone. Because they are not their modules, right? So they need to be the modules of the rest of the models, uh, inside the model. So that's a one direction we're going, the generator. Good. Okay, well, speaking of the generator, uh, you know, there's now the generator, generator plans feature where you can actually script the generator, the steps of the generator, how it should proceed, how it should do the generation. Uh, how many of you use this feature in your, in your projects? Good, perfect. It's good to know because we need to have feedback on this new feature because it's being heavily developed and as, you know, if you give us as, as much feedback you give us, you know, we'll benefit from that definitely. So one of the things you can do with those scripts now, you can fork your build, right? So you can have truly multi-target code generation with fork. Um, the generator at some moment just copies the transient models and continues in, in parallel paths. Um, also, you can now test the uh, test your generator, right? Well, test uh, code that is not tested is rubbish, typically. So having a good generator requires having tests for them. How many of you do tests for the generator at the moment? All right, okay. So that number should hopefully increase in, in the future. After all, it's pretty easy, right? What would you do? Well, the script, the, the test, if you look at it, it's basically listing all the models that you want to involve, and then you specify, okay, taking this input model, using that generation plan, we should generate something and compare it with what we expect to be the output. And if there's difference, you get some error report. Right. So it's pretty easy to use. Okay, you might have noticed this, there is some deprecated code in MBS from time to time. Right. So, so just to help you, if you get into troubles like that, right, there's uh, in the migration menu, uh, there, is, uh, there, are, there are no options that could help you actually to discover whether you're using some of the deprecated API or whether you actually creating or deprecated some of your language elements that you expose to your users. And so you can search for those and get them listed and organized by the, uh, you know, the version that you put in the comment of that, um, of that deprecation tag. So that's something I encourage you to use. Well, one feature I like a lot is the ability to actually suppress false positives in, uh, you know, the current what we call the checking rules. So basically that's a tool for static code analysis, right? There are many tools like that out there. And all that I know of offer you the ability to uh, mark false positives. Because if, if you don't have that possibility, then you start ignoring all the reports that are popping up from, from the editor. So now we have that as well. So actually, if you Um, so you can now, uh, in the code, if you have a, like here, this repeat statement, right, this, this concept now implements, I can suppress errors. I can suppress errors is an interface that gives you uh, a couple of intentions available and the ability to actually annotate that node with annotations <coughs> that indicate that the, that the error has been suppressed for that particular node. So now I can suppress all errors over here, or uh, I can suppress uh, only the selected errors or warnings, and then if the error is suppressed, now the warning is still there, and, and 
to suppress that warning, the hole is suppressed. And here these icons also give me some visual clue that something has been suppressed again. So, yeah, something to consider using. Because, you know, if you don't give the users the ability to suppress false positives, especially for more warnings, right, uh, then they will ignore the messages sooner or later. What's that? Yes. Is this comment slash slash thingy that's inserted when you do the suppression, is that default or is that custom to your Kaya language? It is default, this thing. Okay. Right. I haven't created those uh, messages at all. This, these are basically attributes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but the, the, this is a node attribute from the, um, that is attached. Because if you get this highlight, this red thingy in the gutter that tells you about suppression, why do I need this huge comment in my code? Um, can I give you an example of our project? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. We uh, have uh, still 2018 G6, where this is not the uh, actual look of this node attribute and we had to write an editor for this to make obvious why we were about to uh, uncomment or uh, suppress this error and also automatically insert some comment about the nodes that we were importing and that there were some problems so we can have kind of a documentation and a backlink to the part which is problematic. So it is very nice to have it, and it's really useful. It's not only a tooltip that we need, we want to see it at, at first sight. All right, well, I'm not, not, not sure I clearly understand here. And so, uh, I, mean, I mean, manual comment is obviously possible there, right? But you mean, so automatically inserted link to some code that caused an error? Yeah, we did that. <laughs> We needed that, and also why we uh, decided to suppress this error because this is crucial for the further development and also to create a to-do for uh, uh, making it better next mm -hmm. sprint. Okay, and perhaps we could work on this feature and include something like that. Uh, nice. Is it yeah. personalizable? Um, not that I know of. Right. Uh, <laughs> Because the intention just inserts this uh, attribute, and you would have to perhaps create your own intent. Uh, it's quite intent loud, right? Sorry? It's quite loud, syntactically. Yeah, it, it adds a lot of uh, noise in, in the code, and I don't think there's even like the ability to collapse those. Yeah. Right. So perhaps if we get usability reports on this, we can work on it. Right. This was one. <laughs> so, the interesting thing is, so how many people knew about this feature before me showing it here? Alright, so maybe it's a good thing that I show it, because now maybe more people will try that and report some usability issues. <laughs> good, perfect. So I actually think it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's better to, on our side, to be conservative, right? If you don't really know and don't have enough feedback, just offer something that can be and then later tune it into how, 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 we, how we actually need to use it right, before we put too much effort and then go in the wrong direction. Okay, so that's uh, this little feature. Then, well, we introduced new enumeration, which is a little bit nicer when you look at it, and has better API than you approach it from code when you try to you know, get and compare this selected enumeration member. And also it's, but you will not see it, it's better for us because now we generate it properly, it's no longer needs to be interpreted. So it was like the last remaining element in the structure aspect that uh, prevented us from fully generating you know, the structure. So the enumerations are not there. There's a, uh, uh, there's a migration that migrates you from the old enumerations to the new ones. Uh, full text search. Yeah, I, I wonder how, how it's possible that we were able to live so long yes. without this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we just wanted to get really patient users. <laughs> <laughs> so this feature is now there. So, Aslak, yeah. Does it also search in uh, node or properties that are currently collapsed away? You know, with a little plus thing on the left in the editor. I believe, well, I haven't checked, right? So I, I just assume it does. Yeah, because it looks in properties. 
It will go through the holes. It ignores the okay. that it's a cell. Okay. Cool. So also inspector? Also in the inspector? I think it's general. Okay. It's probably the way this happens. Right. Okay, well, here's the thing. Mm. One question about this research. I'll so right. only check the models, or can you also check the tendencies that climb to this in the search scale? Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, uh, the search uh, also have It's also in the models. They're not just in the models. Well, it can look through all the models in the city, probably within this part of the project, but yeah, it's called maybe expanded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would it work differently than a full text in a traditional language? Because, uh, for instance, Keyword seems like pretty much on the keyboard. All he uses is what you probably find an editor to find that. Okay, well, we introduced recently a new uh, aspect called feedback, and that gives you the ability to customize the messages. That you get from the uh, that you get from uh, from the editor, the error messages. Uh, like for example, you know, here's a, a, a routine definition that violates a constraint that there should be no spaces in the in the name of that uh, thing. And normally, you would get an error that says like uh, something like a constraint violated, right? And no one has an idea of what constraint and why. Now you can customize that message. So the message can actually specify uh, if, you know, if this constraint here is violated, then in the feedback aspect, which is like another aspect model of uh, language definition, you can actually specify the message that should be given uh, when a constraint for that property fails. Um, you can include you can include the you know, the property value and the mode and such. So it's like our first step towards the ability to customize customize the messages, um, or uh, in a similar similar way, if you have a out of scope reference like this one, well, if I'm lucky, it will tell me. That's a nice game, right? Mouse. Get a mouse. Uh, all right. Yeah. Here we go. I can get better all the time. Uh, so now it says it's the type method that is out of scope, and um, you know, instead of just out of scope, that's it. Um, and again, that's because I have this when reference saying that you know, if the definition is out of scope, then we give this message to the user. So, yeah, we're thinking about Marcus, we hear you. It's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of even look at you, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, the plan is. I'm not sure that was your question, but I, I, I assume it was. Just it go ahead and answer it. Anyway. No, <laughs> answer all your questions. Uh, we would like to have this not only uh, allowing you to specify a message to the user, like this is wrong, but maybe you need some different visualization of the error. Maybe you need to, you know, if you use diagram notations, maybe that's a better way to actually report a problem. So we're thinking about how to do that properly. Right. Not only just string and that's it, maybe there's better ways to report uh, different errors. Uh, we haven't experimented with that yet, but we have that in mind, that it will be better to, you know, to allow for this. And now your real question. Yes. So for the other one, I can give you some use cases why we need more than a string. Um, but the other question I had is, why is this a separate aspect? I mean, you don't just define the error message, in this case, for example, as part of the uh, scope definition, or in the case of your space in the word, as part of the uh, constraint checking thing. Why this new thing? Well, the decision wasn't easy to make. But, uh, you know, the, the error messages might come from various aspects, from data flow, for example, right? From, uh, from constraints and from others. So, uh, That's why they should be right there. Well, that's also an option, right? They could be there and here as well. So here we decided, you know, probably it's a better better way to put it here. But um, if you really need someone, you know, Alex probably can defend the decision because he was involved in that decision. So. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> 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 So serious thinking went into this. It wasn't like the first idea to do, let's do another aspect, right? That's, there's never enough aspects. So that, that was thinking. Uh, 
Uh, and actually, the, the very next feature I'm going to show you is. So I'm probably going to have to fix this. I have to wake up my phone each time. Uh, okay, so the next thing is it's. And I really think this is an experimental feature, right? It's not a finished thing. It was to redesign the constraints aspect altogether. Because, you know, if you remember the constraints aspect, there's a section for can be child, can be parent, can be uh, whatever, then properties and then references. And for each, you basically have one giant function that you can specify, and that's it. And it returns true or false occasionally somewhere, and that, that's it. No ability to actually say what is wrong, and no ability to sort of make it like a composition of uh, multiple declarative rules. So we decided let's do it that way. Let's offer actually um, uh, offer um, find us. Yeah. So let's define constraints in a new way. So um, you basically create your block for currently it only supports this can be parent can be child blocks, right? No properties, no references at the moment. Um, so you choose whichever of those you want, can be ancestor, child, parent, and root. And then uh, for that can be childhood, for example, you specify several rules. And each rule is basically an expression that if it relates to Boolean, and if it relates to false, then the message is used as you know to report to the user. Uh, and you can create a devs, which is like basically variables that you pre-compute and then reuse them later on in your in your rules. So then you compute the same thing over and over again. So that is the overall structure that we you know, prepared. And uh, yeah, when writing tests, no, sorry, when writing node tests, we ran into some kind of a problem with the error messages that were produced by those uh, in, from the former one. Uh, is there a possibility to give this um, an identity so we can have it in a node test? So if this um, kind of uh, check failed, then uh, or we also write uh, negative tests if that error doesn't come. So right, right. Well, that would be sensible to have. I didn't try myself, so I don't know if it currently is supported or not. Because usually it takes uh, the first. Uh, 26 um, characters of the string and create something out of it. And that's Are you mean even in the, in the, in the old one? Right? In the old one, yes. Oh, okay. uh, this one I didn't try out yet. I don't know the time. Okay. So it would be need to identify these errors. So you like to give it explicitly a unique name and then use it in this test. Okay. Exactly. The type system errors is already possible when you're checking those. Yeah. You have to import some language which is called something called test, and then it will allow it to specify names for the checking for the error messages. Nice. Thank you. But not for constraints, right? As far as I know. Okay. Cool. Basla? Um, yeah. Can I define these rules uh, in like a library fashion without Doing this in the language that declares the concept? Without what? Without creating them? Uh, so I would like to create them not in the language that defines the concept, but I would like to have maybe a library of constraints. And then what I would like to do in my language that extends concepts, um, just import this library and apply different predefined rules mm -hmm. to that concept. Maybe because the concept con uh, confirms to an interface, etc. Because right now, constraint composition over interfaces can end up in really, really interesting cases with diamond shape inheritance, etc. So making this decision explicit that I apply these constraints from the super concepts could help us to make these error messages more deterministic, especially if you use interfaces with um, predefined checking rules or constraints already and then just import them to make your concepts that are the to use in our language, um, more easier to, to implement, um, this, this can help a lot. Okay, you know, that's why we have this experimental thing you think there. So that's exactly what we're looking for. So I think I should share a document with you where the team uh, wrote together some of these ideas that we have for a, right. for a 
a thing of constrained libraries, and we actually implemented something of our own as a, as a prototype, as a new language aspect called constrained libraries, which is basically to generate into uh, static methods that simply return booleans. But I think I can share with you what we thought of there. Maybe you can use this as a. Yeah, perfect. So I think Alexei will have to also talk about it in the rest. <laughs> Sure. Ask him why he moved these things into a separate language aspect as well. I, I know why, and I, uh, so at least I have an idea why. Are you afraid to talk to me directly? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that you can define your custom error message in, in the new language. Hmm. Alright, so I'll go on. Uh, well, there's a few more features I want to show, just to you know, give the, you some number, right? Mm. Uh, and that's not all the features that I'll show here. It's about a third of all the features I've found in, uh, since the last meetup in, in Ule. So, um, yeah, you can do no uh, history per root, just right click on a, on a, on a root node and you get history. So, uh, I mean, you get history, so that's a uh, sort of usability issue. Um, no action maps for the editor, they can inherit from others, <coughs> so you can, you can reuse them uh, and then authorize those that you want to change. Uh, we moved to Java 11 now with uh, the recent version, so the runtime is now Java 11. We also try to improve base language, yeah, add some features from, uh, from, from the recent Java, not all of them, but some. So as we go, so we improve it. Uh, now you can reorganize elements in the project pane. That's uh, uh, one of the features required by some of our clients. So the alphabetic order might be good for most cases, but not for all. So you know, it's good to actually be able to customize this order. And you know, there, there are more usability issues like that. We get some actually for free because they come from the platform that we build on. Some of them are our work. So you, know, you can integrate uh, with the Mac touch bar, and you can have spell checker, and uh, some colors in the completion menu, and all that. And last but not the least is the new documentation. As I already mentioned, now the documentation is now uh, has been moved. It's been moved to the internal um, to the internal platform that JetBrains um, uh, has built. So now you just press F1 and you get documentation that contains all, including you know how to install MPS, how to get started, and also the the sort of introductory tutorial that should help you get started. Uh, the good old user guide has been migrated in here, plus all the sections about how to actually use the UI. They've been re sort of uh, re-imported and changed to reflect the current state of affair. Well, that, that's not perfect. There's still things that can be improved, but I think we've invested a lot of time into making the documentation better. Plus. There's now this uh, ability to change the key mapping, key map you use, so that the shortcuts you get from documentation match the real ones you use. And, and uh, there's a search box now that actually searches pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can get your answers from here. Okay, uh, I think that even ex exceeded the time that I was given, but I think it was, hopefully it was worth it. So yeah. that's all, all, all I could have. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Alexander Chatan. I'm working on JetBrains and MBS, and uh, the topic of my presentation is about applying web MBS technology in a biological knowledge based project. Uh, so let me start with a few words about the biological knowledge based project. Uh, first of all, it's under the active development right now, so please excuse me if there will be any problems during the demo. I expect that they will. <laughs> uh, it should be an independent uh, commercial project, and I believe it should be a commercially successful project, at least that's the plan for now. Uh, it is implemented together with the GeneStack uh, company, with the developers from GeneStack. Uh, GeneStack is um, uh, a well-known company in the biological computation area around the uh, data in the biological research. Uh, it, uh, the biological knowledge-based project will be based on uh, the MPS technology uh, and the plan is first of all to release the biological knowledge-based project and uh, in the meantime use it to collect uh, 
the requirements and improve the uh, web and base technology. And after that, we will focus on the reason the web and base itself. So we decided that it would be beneficial for uh, the web and base technology to uh, to try to create some real project on top of it first. Uh, that's few reasons why we made it this way. For a biological knowledge-based project, I believe that uh, the web base would be beneficial because we decided and we feel that DSLs are quite good and powerful in the uh, area of uh, entering structured knowledge, which is important for biological knowledge base. Uh, projection editor is very well accepted by non-developers. It provides us with uh, the good uh, guidance while typing the uh, into structure. It's it's much more powerful than the normal textual editor. If you don't know don't know anything about the language you're working with and stuff like that, um, uh, we we expect actually to to see some requirements for non-textual notations uh, from the field of the project, and especially in, uh, in composition with textual notations. This means that we probably think about switching from textual to non-textual notations. Uh, and uh, we feel that not only textual, uh, not, not only projection editor will be important for the project. Uh, probably some other pieces of classical NPS have to be ported to the web as well. Uh, but we'll see. For the web MBS, this is first of all the integration with real web project. We never did that before, and it's it's point of interest of, of this activity. Uh, we feel that we will make uh, web-based uh, projection editor more mature based on that experience, and uh, we will definitely define uh, an important pieces of uh, NPS infrastructure which have to be implemented into the, into the project. So let me switch to the demo of the project. Um, that works. Something like it is. So on this screen you can see uh, a GSTEC platform with the application, biological knowledge based application, open on top of it. On the left side uh, you can see a document browser. Uh, we, we group documents by document kind, which actually is something like a root concept within the, within the uh, root node, right? Uh, so we have different type of uh, document kinds, like link library, property libraries, um, some of them are specific for the biological knowledge base uh, project itself, some of them may be imported or integrated with the GSTEC platform, like for example ontologies, they are common for all the biological data, and uh, all these kind of documents can be kind of um, not primary because they are used to express the main uh, main topic of the project, the, uh, the BTB documents or the actual knowledge around the biological uh, research effects. So if I double click on the document on the left side, the projection editor is opened on the uh, on the right side, right? Uh, each document is actually saved in a GeneStack file. They have files. Uh, the, we choose JSON as a persistent format, so the um, <coughs> process is that if you double click on the document on the left side, it will be first parsed, then the model is reconstructed in the memory of the browser, then projectional uh, rules will be used to, or editing rules will be used to actually render the model on the screen. So very, very similar to you have an MPS but in the browser. So there's no server-side representation of the model? Uh, JSON. We can, well, we can, we can make a start on the server-side as well. Yeah, but let me talk about that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, um, by default, uh, you can see read only view on the right side because this is, this is kind of a snapshot of the knowledge base for now. But if you are a power enough user, you may try to edit it. So we <laughs> have uh, the edit button. I'll take about I'll talk about permissions a bit later. <laughs> if I uh, click on the edit button, uh, so-called working copy of the document will be created on the screen. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, and now I can start editing that. So I'm using enter, just like an MPS, to create new structure element. I can type uh, my var. A parameter value uh, just by typing. I can use control space to choose uh, 
I think the target, say, where are you? Uh, like this, I can use cont v to jump by the reference. So we, uh, shortly speaking, try to make uh, the experience of the editor comparable to the <coughs> experience of the editor when the end. Yes, please, question. Uh, uh, all of the other aspects then, are they running in the browser, like the type system and all those <coughs> things? Okay, I will repeat the question. The question is about the other aspects of the MPS, like type system and stuff like that. Are they run executed in the browser or not? For now, we do not have anything except of the editor and the model, and we will think about running type system. It's a, it's a good question. Probably it will be just out of my head, it will be probably executed somewhere in the cloud, and then results will be rendered on the on the uh, browser, but it's under the discussion right now, and even not under the development. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, but you did have a scope, right? To, to get the information? Yes, we have scope. Yeah. We have scope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if someone else is uh, trying to edit the same document, uh, we... I, I'm not sure how to say it. We uh, clearly have just one one working copy of the document, right? So th this is this may be a restriction or we, this may be recognized as a as a feature. But anyway, the specific of this uh, framework is that if you press uh, where is it? Ah, okay, I have to reconnect. Okay, so if I uh, click on the read on the version of the document in another browser, it may be another user or just me working from home. And uh, yeah, I probably click on the A button. Now I see the working copy, uh, yeah, which is exactly the same working copy. So if I try to enter, okay, it's not visible. If I try to enter some facts in one browser um, and just type some values, it will be immediately um, or not immediately um, propagated to another browser, right? So uh, technically, it should work in a way that uh, two different clients work with the same uh, working copy of the documents simultaneously, just like you do with the with the Google uh, Docs. And uh, this is actually a result of operation transformation working somewhere in the cloud. So we have to integrate operation transformation server into the system, and it is executed as a service as a part of this GeneStack platform. Um, Type in the right document that the You mean here? Let's try. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, the internet connection is quite slow here, and they have to use the internet to connect to the temporary server. So it is very, you know, network kind of not um, not very stable right now. Okay. Anyway. Uh, that's uh, all about the working copies. Uh, what I can tell else is probably a few, a few words about the structure because we will need it in the future. So the structure of the uh, BTB document is very simple. The BTB document is a root concept, so to say. It has categories inputs, which are not so important, that it, and it may uh, contain a number of fact sets where we capture different facts. Right? Each fact is... Um, Actually, there may be maybe a number of facts. It's, each fact actually represents uh, uh, a biological process, biochemical reaction, or some just knowledge about uh, something within the area of biology. And we can uh, actually put uh, logical relations between different facts. Like, for example, I can say that uh, the amount of tissue, that's fact number one, and we have fact number two, which is presence of cells, say this one, yeah, and we can put a connection that uh, fact number one has some relation to fact number two. Uh, this is uh, talking briefly how the, the structure of the knowledge is uh, is uh, modeled here, and actually this is uh, obviously a graph containing the nodes and different relations between the nodes as an ages. And uh, the idea of this uh, biological knowledge based project is uh, that we would like to provide the functionality to looking for different connections within the graphs. Graph, yeah. So um, the end of the working copy is a publishing process. If I press on the publish button, the uh, state which I uh, had in the editor will be published and available as a single state of the knowledge base. Uh, okay, 
So let's uh, move to the queries part. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit surprised that the other instance was public. Uh, yeah, it probably wasn't updated. If I refresh, yeah, it's, you know, yeah. not everything is working. <laughs> Okay, so query. Let me create a new query. Um, let's say that I would like to find the connection from the process of uh, a state of uh, synchronic information to the state of uh, what is likeness. I have some data entered in the knowledge base. Um, so if I press run button, the query will be executed again in the cloud, and the result will be finally rendered here on the screen. And you see that we found one connection. Okay, what is the base? Uh, yeah, one, one more thing is that here and here you can see projection letters as well, right? So it's obviously all, all the stuff is projection later. Uh, so the connection is actually very, very simple in this case because there is a document which has uh, a fact set containing two facts. One is uh, chronic information and another is polyfacts, and they are connected, obviously. Okay, let's try to look for something more complex. Uh, now I'll try to find the connection from uh, <coughs> the process of the state of chronic information to the state of awareness of cells. Please, please don't pay too many attention to what I'm typing right now. It's absolutely <laughs> nonsense from the side of biology. Believe me, I, I just uh, type in something. <laughs> uh, okay. I press the uh, run query button and now I can see uh, a little bit more complex connection uh, which is actually contain which is which contains two pieces of two different documents right so one document is actually connecting uh, chronic inflammation state with body fitness and another document is connecting body fitness with fitness of cells so this is more or less the illustration of the video of the query process so someone would like to find the connection between two processes two different different uh, um, patterns uh, upon the graph and then absolutely uh, different and maybe complex connections may, may be uh, explored and, uh, and uh, reported to the user even not so so simple that you can just understand from browsing the, the data. Right. Uh, so uh, I use the word pattern because uh, on the right side you can see actual data which is representing the process with specified parameters it's possible to specify parameters and so on and on the right side you may specify the process and just few of the parameters or even no parameters or even no process but some parameters inside so this is kind of wildcard which have to be first matched upon the nodes within the knowledge graph and then we will try to find all possible connections from all starting nodes to all ending nodes and that's more or less the function that we would like to, to um, have as a, as a final result of the project. Okay, yeah, I touched mm -hmm. a little bit the question of permissions, but they are inherited from the gene stack. Uh, you see that I'm logged in as a user, so I have some permission rights. Each file or document in our terms has access rights, so I may be able to just um, view some documents or Edit another piece of documents or some set of documents may be, may be, uh, may be not visible for me because they are proprietary for organization and so on. So this is kind of, I'm talking about that because um, I think this is important that we, we, not, um, we are not providing the, the complete server handling all the use cases for you as a closed, closed uh, black box, but rather we are trying to integrate the technology into the different Frameworks, and this is an example of that kind of integration. Okay, so now I probably have to switch back to the slides. And um, say a few words about the technology itself. So, using the uh, Currently, the uh, is actually an, a plugin for IntelliJ IDEA. So, we build it internally, install it into the IntelliJ API, and start using that. Uh, we do generate base language of Java out of, or out of our language definition languages within the Eventbase plugin. We use JWT as a possibility to translate Java to JavaScript. Uh, we do save Java sources in version control. Uh, this is an interesting point. 
from the very beginning we didn't do that, but uh, we decided that it's actually not, uh, I mean, this is all specific for the plugin story probably, but this is actually not important for uh, non-language developers to see the language definition languages in order to be able to, to write the web application, right? So we provide two different modes. Web developers may just, you know, use plain, uh, plain IntelliJ idea and use JWT to compile the, the JavaScript. And language developer will install the plugin and be able to modify language definition inside it. Um, <coughs> and yeah, we use Maven. That's just historical reasons. In this project, we, we use uh, Maven as a, as a building, uh, building tool. Uh, on this side, you can see a uh, concept definition in the Devon Best plugin. It is very similar to MPS, but we use different language. Uh, we in the past, we have designed, designed a set of languages for language definition um, use case, which are a little bit more declarative and a little bit more independent from Java than currently existing uh, languages. So we decided to use that in, in, in the web-based project. Uh, but, um, I mean, they are more or less similar to what we have in MPS. You see, this is a root concept. You can create it as a root. It has a number of child elements with multiple cardinality. It has references to different concepts. I mean, that child references actually points to the different concepts. <coughs> uh, the interesting thing is that we include query just in the, in the concept. So you can say, get library link and type implementation. This is query or behavior in terms of MPS. Right? What is uh, that language down there that you used to write this stuff? Uh, what is this language? The, the one to write the query. Uh, it's, it's query language. It's, it's not beta language. Okay. Yeah. It's not collections language, it's not beta language, it's completely new independent small language for so the next stop in, uh, in the language definition is obviously the definition of the editor, we call it notation. Uh, uh, it is different from the notation in MPS, but if we look closer, uh, it, it is comparable. So you see this is a constant categories with, with the style keyword, kw. Uh, the child reference categories is rendered by the uh, comma separated notation category for corresponding concept and then same with imports and flat sets and below you can see the annotation for the category which actually says that first we, we have to uh, put the reference library then slash then reference element here you can see the results of that of that editor so the constant categories then reference uh, for the library and then slash and the reference for the element um, again everything is uh, editable as you, as you have seen and uh, Comparable to what we have in MPS from the uh, from the uh, yeah, descriptive point of view, the benefit of this notation is that we can um, obviously try to to look closer to the textual uh, representation of this notation and try to generate a parser out of it in order to support copy and paste. Uh, the question is how to implement or how to include different notations. <coughs> Actually, each notation element is uh, just a concept in terms of MPS, so you can extend it and put a table here and do something with that. Right? So, uh, yeah, that's, I think, all about the notation. And we have another aspect which is covered currently in the development uh, story, that's a scopes aspect. So if you have a concept with the reference, you can uh, annotate it with use scopes annotation and uh, define a scoping rule for, for some concept, providing the scope for a target of the reference, right? Uh, actually, it's, it's again similar to the scopes within the MPS, but different, different declarative level uh, or definition level, uh, right? So the logic is that if you press control space on some reference within the editor, we will try to traverse the containment tree up in order to get the Concept which has scope view providing us with the scopes of this target of the reference. Uh, yeah, and uh, we limit actually the possible conditions within the editor with the, with the scope nodes. Yes, question? Is that running on the client or on some kind of server? It is, it is on the client. <laughs> so that means there is a potentially a scalability issue with parsing all the files. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And we actually reached that with the whole right. large ontology. Yeah. Elements we saw that temporary by, by implementing uh, custom scoping rules using index from yeah. from the platform actually going to the server. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a question how to how to solve it in general. 
And I think that's all about uh, the WebMPS functionality. Right now, we do not have anything else. And the plan is uh, actually to limit the functionality for the first version of the WebMPS as much as possible in order to not, you know, to not develop a huge framework, but rather focus on something to make the editor available for, for, for users. And yeah, we will see. We will think about the future. Uh, that's a slide about replacing JWT with OpenJS. So uh, a lot of, at least our uh, uh, known developers, uh, complains about JWT. They just simply feel that this technology is not so good right now, it's not modern and stuff like that. Uh, fortunately, we have a Kotlin JavaScript in, uh, in uh, JetBrains, which actually is uh, a Kotlin, uh, which can, can be compiled to JavaScript similar to JWT to some extent, and we have a control on top of that technology. Uh, Open is a very good language in comparison with Java from the side of programming it. I tried that, it's, it's, it's very cool. Um, <laughs> and actually we decided that we will try to migrate the platform which is used for uh, okay, runtime of the WebMPS to the code uh, Because, I mean, JWT was a, was a kind of program part for, for uh, accepting the technology for a long time. Okay, so the plan is that we will first migrate uh, library supporting operation transformation projection editor to Kotlin. Then we will create a set of Kotlin-based internal DSLs in order to be able to hand program on top of that library because we want to, to be Kotlin native actually. It's, uh, it's, I think it makes sense for any technology to use as, uh, as native way as possible. Then we will um, implement a uh, currently available set of version editors, which I have shown you during the demo, on top of the new version of the library in order to see that it works. And then, as a next step, we will review uh, results and try to understand how to generate copy based code from uh, from MPS. Yes. Uh, the question is, does it mean Kotlin implement implementation of an MPS? I don't know yet. I actually was thinking about the last point for a long time, how to phrase it, because the idea is that I cannot answer this question right now. Right? So, yeah, we will see. Uh, the project itself is uh, under active development right now, and especially this activity is research activity. So, we will see. It may happen even that we will fail with the migration to Kotlin at some point. Just before that step. Okay, so and now I'm trying to present briefly the roadmap of the MPS eleven uh, project. First, we want to, to finish the migration to Kotlin and understand what to do with that technology. Then we would like to focus on the releasing biological knowledge-based project based on top of the WebMPS technology. Then we will focus on the releasing the first version of the WebMPS technology, uh, obviously including structure, queries uh, here. Uh, editor, scopes, and operation transformation service, maybe something else, I don't know yet. Right? And then we will plan the next version, next, uh, the future of the WebMPS. Okay, I think that's all from my side. Thank you for attention. Yes, Marcus. Will this be a commercial tool or open source? Okay, logical question. <laughs> uh, technically, it may be open source, right? but we will definitely try to make uh, make money on top of it, so the license will be kind of commercialized, right? especially for the operational transformation story. Right? Um, I think it's it's um, too early to think about that even, but just you know, thinking about this question before the meetup, I came to the idea that probably we end up with some hosted solution and you know free version for two free clients and, mm, yeah, you know yeah, something like that. Yeah. It's absolutely different, yeah. different strategy yeah. maybe applicable here, but we definitely want to make it make it commercial because we think that um, server side commercial project is something we should maybe accept it as well. Yes, Are you thinking about making parts of it embeddable as in the back components which embeddable into our application? Yeah, the question is about making uh, a part of the MMS embeddable into, into the web applications. So I'm not sure I understand this question completely because I'm not a very 
in their development, believe me. Right? But uh, I intentionally presented you the demo of the GeneStack part, where you can see the web browser, and only a part is the browser is uh, is a projection like it, right? So the rest, like document view, notifications, is something which was uh, either a part of the GeneStack platform, absolutely standalone from the Ethereum test project, or even coded by web developers who <coughs> no, don't you know, understand the technology. So we think about integration, we want to make it integrated. That's the goal. Yes, please, question? Uh, what makes Kotlin preferable in this? The question is, what makes Kotlin preferable? Um, good question, yeah. I was thinking about that as well, how to answer it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that the, the best answer is that uh, you can compare coding in Java and coding in Kotlin. I always chose Java over Kotlin because of the static nature of Kotlin. Okay, in the past I chose Java ahead of Kotlin, but once I tried that, I cannot you, I cannot see Java anymore. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> because ah, because is, because I mean, Kotlin is cool. I understand. <laughs> so just from the side of you know coding, expressing eases, constraints, it eases a lot. Yes, statically yeah. typing, it's mm -hmm. much much more ahead of Java, right? <coughs> so, uh, you know, just supporting and writing code on Kotlin is much better than, than doing the same with Java. And, uh, well, JWT, as I mentioned, is uh, under control of Google, yeah. so we don't, we cannot say anything about the future. So Google may say that this, no, uh, this project has a bright future, but in the next year it will be closed. Is it actually developed still in JWT? Is it was, or uh, I think so. It is. I think it's so. It's uh, not part on Google anymore. Okay. So I, I'm not sure is it good or bad news. <laughs> yes, question. Did you think about uh, reusing some other uh, editor technology, for example, the custom? So the question is uh, about reusing some other technology. Um, no, we did not because we have this, you know, operation transformation and proje uh, projectional editor library for a long time already. Already developed with some mature state, and the plan is actually to make it really, really, uh, you know, used. Um, we even think at some point uh, about using that in MPS, in client side MPS, because the the nature of the project is that you write uh, a code in Java or Kotlin, so it may be executed both on the client or on the server side and in their browser, right? So Java or JavaScript is, is, a, is a platform for writing the code. This is actually important because operational transformation is working, I mean, the same code is working on server and on the client. So we have to make it, you know, cross-platform. And uh, a side effect of that is the projection editor is cross-platform as well. So we probably will think about using the same technology in MPS, maybe somewhere in the future, if it will be not so huge amount of work. Yes, my question. I know it's probably hard to answer, but still, can you put any time frame to this first release of the MPS? So, the question is about time frame for the first release of the MPS. I, for me, put the, the constraint that the knowledge base project have to be ready in a year from now. Mm -hmm. So, the MPS probably plus one. Something like that, but I mean, it's hard to answer it. One more question. Uh, do you consider making Kotlin as a base language in MPS? The question is about making Kotlin as a base language uh, within the MPS. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. It's, uh, I mean, I cannot say you that we will uh, make it uh, available in MPS in the next release, but that's an option. Else? Okay, then that's it.